So where, when you should especially think about this if you're seeing patients is if someone comes in, it won't all be like this, but if someone comes in and there, it's an early onset, 45 to 60. Now this woman actually began her first symptoms way earlier, early 50s, but she, I did not hear about her until she was in her late 60s, as I mentioned. So often so associated with perimenopause or menopause. The non-amnestic presentation that I mentioned earlier, when you see that, uh, often with executive dysfunction and or dyscalculia, then it really should make you think about mycotoxin or other toxin-associated cognitive decline. And I should mention, if they also have an amnestic component, which she did she, when she forgot to pick up her granddaughters, they're often APOE4 positive, which she was. If they're APOE4 negative, however, this is a common reason to have cognitive decline. The APOE4 negatives don't have as often uh, the risk for things like a cognitive decline associated with inflammation or with uh, insulin resistance. They relatively commonly have problems associated with insulin resistance, uh, uh, associated with uh, mycotoxins uh, or tick-borne illnesses, another common one. If it's accompanied by depression, of course, most people who develop Alzheimer's, it's not associated with depression early on at least. Um, this woman clearly had some depression. And again, that triggered us to think, okay, this may be a mycotoxin associated uh, contributor. If they have low serum zinc, if they have low triglycerides, and she had both, low glutathione, also common, and of course, BCS failure. Now, interestingly, some of these will have SIRS related symptoms as Dr. Shoemaker uh, described years ago, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. But Interestingly, as he pointed out to me, most of the people that we see and the ones that we've reported haven't met the criteria for SIRS. So they don't have the ice pick pains and they don't have the electric shocks and they don't have the lung problems and they don't have the rashes and things like that. However, about a third of them do. One of the other features, they are hypersensitive to stress, probably because they have HPA access to dysfunction. But for whatever reason, what we hear frequently is this person was going along. And for example, one of the ones was from a law practice. He had the toughest case of his life, spent two years up all night, all the time, won the case, and then completely crumped. We hear this all the time. And the other common thing is someone will get better and then they will start going on overnight flights or they will take on a new job or that sort of thing. And they'll go downhill again. So this woman, part of her doing so well is she has made sure that she doesn't have a tremendous amount of stress. So these people tend to be hypersensitive to stress. And then if they have headache and or sinusitis, that's another tip off that this may be mycotoxin related illness. So if you think about it, this really is a pandemic without a vaccine. And I'll show you why here. So for perspective, uh, COVID-19 has actually now killed uh, over a million Americans. And for comparison, of the currently living Americans, about 330 million Americans, uh, about 45 million of us will die. So we're still at over 45 times the number. So it's a, it's a pandemic that actually dwarfs the COVID-19 pandemic. And here's why. With COVID-19, it's a relatively simple illness. Um, we know it's a virus, we have sequence of the virus, we have sequence of the variants, we know what Omicron, Delta, all these different things are. With Alzheimer's, that has not been the case. We don't have an agreement on what this actually is. And so therefore, people have the idea that it's type 3 diabetes, or that it's herpes simplex, or that it's a prion, or that it's amyloid, or that it's tau, and on and on and on but there's not agreement. In fact, none of those ideas has ever led to significant treatment. So we need to understand the fundamental nature of Alzheimer's, which is what our research has been about for the last 30 years. And there are over 150,000 papers from all over the world that have been published on this disease. And so pretty much any idea that you come up with, you can pretty much rule it out just by looking at the papers. We need something that will actually tell us what to do. So as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, there's a problem here 
which is that there's a term mild cognitive impairment, which is used every day by doctors. And unfortunately, it's a relatively late stage uh, of the Alzheimer's pathophysiology. So you begin the pathophysiology about 20 years before a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And MCI is the third of four stages. And what happens is doctors will say, don't worry, it's just mild. It's mild cognitive impairment. And the person goes home, don't worry. They told me, don't worry, it's just mild cognitive impairment. No, that actually should be called advanced stage Alzheimer's disease because it is the second to the last stage of this disease. Phase one is you're asymptomatic. You don't have symptoms at the beginning and you can already show changes. And this is for many people in their thirties and forties. So the disease that when I was training in neurology, we thought of as a disease of your sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties is really a disease of your thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, which gets diagnosed 20 to 25 years later. So in the first phase, you're asymptomatic, but your spinal fluid will show abnormalities. Your PET scan will show abnormalities even at the beginning. Then phase two is subjective cognitive impairment. You know there's something wrong. Often your spouse will know that there's something wrong. Perhaps your coworkers will know there's something wrong. But if you take a formal test, you'll still be scoring in the normal range. So that's called subjective cognitive impairment. And the reality is everybody should know. So this is why it's so critical. Get in. People will tell you, ah, it's just normal aging. No, normal aging should not be accompanied by problems with memory and problems with drawing a clock and problems with these sorts of things. Now, SCI lasts about 10 years. This is what the epidemiologists have shown. This is huge because it tells us we have an amazing window to reverse this. Virtually everybody with SCI can be reversed and return to normal function. But the problem is that people wait and wait and wait until they're in late stage of Alzheimer's. Again, cognitive symptoms without abnormal cognitive testing. Now, if you don't do anything about this, you typically will progress over those 10 years into MCI, which as you can see, is really the third phase of a four phase illness. We call it MCI and by definition now, you do have abnormal cognitive testing, but you're still having normal activities of daily living. When you begin to do activities of daily living begin to be a challenge, that's when you have full on dementia, in this case due to Alzheimer's disease. Five to 10% of people with MCI will convert to full dementia each year. And then the final phase is Alzheimer's disease. And again, th this should really be called final phase. And this is where your activities of daily living are affected. So you can see the problem here is we focus and everyone has focused on understanding and treating Alzheimer's disease. This is like saying, we're not going to call it diabetes until you have ketoacidosis. It makes no sense. We want to understand pre-diabetes and even insulin resistance and what gets us there. That will give us much, much better outcomes. Now, what we've seen with the protocol we've developed is virtually everybody with SCI gets better. People who go on prevention, we haven't had a single example of people progressing to dementia. MCI, the majority, and I'll show you, we did a trial with people with MCI and Alzheimer's, the majority improved. Once you have full-on Alzheimer's, some of them improve, and we've had people uh, go from MOCAs of 19 to perfect 30, and we've had people go from MOCAs of zero to nine. We've not ever had a person go from a MOCA of zero, end-stage Alzheimer's, to a perfect 30. That's the goal. We want to understand what does it take to bring someone from the precipice of death, end stage Alzheimer's, all the way to perfectly normal. It may, it may involve stem cells, intranasal trophic factors, we don't know, transplantation, we don't know yet. The good news is you have a very large window to in phase one, phase two, and even into phase three, and sometimes phase four, to get quite good outcomes if you simply get in there as early as possible. So as I said, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, unfortunately, typically made about 20 years after the initial biochemical changes. Mm -hmm.